Hello, it's the Friday Talkie. So I was sitting there last night thinking what the hell am I going to talk about tomorrow because I really... <sighs> Friday Talkies are probably the hardest videos I do not in terms of research like say system reviews or whatever but just having something to talk about. Very often I just turn the camera on without a clue and go blah and amazingly something comes out. <laughs> But anyway, I was asked a question last night by a NeoJ999 gamer. It's a question I have been asked before, but not in such I say not in such detail. Um bits of his question have been asked by different people at different times. So I thought I would cover the whole subject. And it is about tapes, um tape loading games. How how does that work kind of thing and if it works in the way that he thinks it works, can you use other formats? I'll explain. Um, okay. I will use the Spectrum as an example, but this works for pretty much any computer. I'll explain that in detail as well. Here's your ZX Spectrum 48K you probably won't see because the camera won't focus you've got two sockets there ear and mic into which you take your little jack plug thingamajigs and you plug them in there like that and at the other end you plug them into your tape deck now we've got assorted inputs on this thing but anyway uh, you have to get your ear and your, your your mic and your earphone sockets, you're in and you're out the right way round. I'm always confused as to which is meant to go where because they're not always obvious. And then you type your commands into your computer, usually load speech marks, speech marks, enter, and you press play on your tape, and it sounds like what have we got in here? Mini Star Trek for the Sword M5. You don't see that very often. You've probably never seen that before. You'll probably never see it again. I must try and actually make the game load. I don't know. I think this may be one I tried before and couldn't make work. Anyway, this does a weird thing. This, what this is going to do straight away is something you would not normally get on a tape game, but I'm just going to play it to you because it's cool. This is what normally happens. Play. Yeah. Music to my ears. More? So, it makes noises like an old modem, and that's your data, and that goes through your, your headphone socket into your computer, and it converts that into a digital signal. It, it's all noughts and ones, and it's like noise for one, no noise for naught kind of thing, though pitch seems to be relevant as well. And that's how it works, it's all analogue to digital conversion to create data. You used to be able to send, well you still could if you had that kind of computer, send data over radio. Um, I know some CB users and uh, possibly some amateur radio users used to do that kind of thing. They would send data over the airwaves. There was a radio show I'm sure that used to do that. Or was it TV? Can't remember. Um, and yes, to answer um, Jake's question, you can put data in that form onto vinyl. It will work. Basically, anything that can store audio clearly with minimum loss of quality, you can use and store data like that. It's slow. It's really bloody slow. Um, 
a 16k, well, a 1k game on a ZX81 takes a minute to load, maybe, maybe a bit less. 16k, eh, I suppose a minute doesn't add up because 16k doesn't take 16 minutes. Anyway, it, it, it all depends how big your game is and different computers load at different speeds. The Commodore 64 takes a bloody age, where the Acorn Electron is fairly quick. Um, there are other things that you can use that are quite useful. It's funny actually, I mean, they're 25, 30 year old tapes. I'm finding actually a really quite a reliable medium for storage. I have had far more floppy disks and CDs fail on me than I have had tapes fail. Um, I've got a massive great big box of Amiga CDs, cover discs, off of Amiga format and see you Amiga magazines. I look after my discs. They're all in their cases. They've been kept out of the light. They're sat in the loft. And they're all dead. Now, I don't know what it is that killed them. Maybe it was the heat in summer. They, you look at them and they don't look oxidised. I don't know what's happened to them, but none of them work and the only reason I haven't thrown them out is pure sentimental value and I just can't bring myself to throw away those those discs that I used so much. Um, yeah, so I've had masses of CDs die on me, uh, quite a few floppy, Amiga floppies, um, tapes, very few. But anyway, getting back to what I was going to say, you can use other formats to store audio data like that. Something like this, little mini CD player, you can use in exactly the same way as that tape player, headphone socket, you just run a lead from that to the input socket on the computer. Now getting the audio onto a CD, you can like back up your tapes. You could run the, uh, uh, a lead from the tape player to an audio input on your computer, record it as a WAV, and then what I would do then is save it as a WAV onto CD, make it an audio CD, and you could play it back via one of these. It is possible to save them out as an MP3. This thing will also play MP3s. I think this one does. I've got one that does. I think this is the one. Doesn't matter. Anyway, if you've got an MP3 playing one, you could play it from this, you could play it from say a laptop runner, a lead out from your headphone socket to the input on the computer, play it as an MP3. Now when you do that you really do need a high quality MP3, like maximum bit rate or whatever, um, because the data compression does affect the reliability of it. I, I I remember going on a forum, and I think it was for the um, Eli, uh, yeah, yeah, Enterprise 64, and someone had uploaded a whole load of audio files for games, data audio files, and a load of people tried them, and they said they just won't work. And it was the compression; it, it converted the WAVs to MP3s because it saved space. I can see his logic; they sounded fine to his ear, but it just wiped out the data. It took, it changed it from being useful data to just a load of screeching noise that didn't mean anything to anyone and not to the computer in, in, in the word thing. Yes. Now, the thing about that that is useful. There, right, emulators when emulators started becoming popular people found they'd got all these um, tapes knocking around say from their spectrum they've got a mass of spectrum tapes and they've got this spectrum emulator on their PC or Amiga or whatever they've got it on but they had no way easy way of getting the data from the tape onto the emulator some emulators actually would let you use a, a, a audio input and I imagine this isn't how they did it initially. Um, so you could load your tape into your PC emulator through a, through an audio input in the old-fashioned way, <coughs> and then save it as a 
what do they use? Tap, a tap file, dot tap. Or in some cases, a cas file, dot cas. Yeah, and sometimes that would be done through an emulator, but these days all of that is done through programs like WAV2TAP or WAV2CAS, just a small program that converts uh, an audio file, you, so you play your tape into your computer, save it out as a WAV, and then you get a little program that will convert that to a TAP or a CAS or a D file I think they use on, um, no, they, uh, what do they use on the Commodore 64? D is a, no it's a T file isn't it? Yeah, and a P file on the ZX81, and I think an O file on the ZX80, but anyway, I, I, I'm totally digressing there. Yes, you could save them in off of tape onto your PC as a WAV, then convert them to the kind of format that your emulator uses. Great, because the internet is chock full of those files. So, how is that useful to you with your old computer? You can convert them back again. A TAP file is no use to you if you've got a real spectrum. But the WAV file is, and you can use TAP to WAV or I think that goes back the other way, maybe there's a different program called wav to tap can't remember, but basically what's been converted one way can be converted back the other, so you convert your tap file, cast file, T file, whatever, back to a WAV, and then you can either play it out of a laptop or burn it to a CD and put it in one of those little CD players, whatever. You can make it back into an audio file and play it back into your Spectrum or whatever, and it works. Um, because I've done this, uh, I, I'm going to do it on, on the MSX. Now I've found that I've got a working audio leads for my MSX because I wasn't at all sure. There are a whole load of CAS files out there. I'm going to grab them. I've done it with, it's the only way I could get Enterprise software and a lot of the ZX81 software I've got, I got that way. So uh, it is really, really handy. If you've got a tape recorder, if you've got the leads, don't ask me specifically what software you need to convert it because all I would do is what you could do yourself. Google it. Um, tap to WAV and uh, there are several programs like tap with two spelt two but then there are somewhere it's all spelled out. There, there are loads of programs that will do that. Google it. You'll find them really easily most times. There are occasions where Dumping to a CD is not an option. Um, like doing for the Spectrum or the ZX81 or whatever. Basically, computers where you've got leads like this, it's easy because you just take your WAV files and dump them onto a CD. Fantastic. There are some systems where that's just not an option like the Commodore 64 or the Atari 8-bit because they've got their own proprietary tape deck which works exactly like any other tape deck except they don't use these at the end. Bastards! They force you to buy their own deck which means you can't plug a CD player into it. You've got to use their tape deck. So the only way to do that is to play the WAV out of your PC with audio leads plugged into e your tape recorder and have an audio cassette in there and record the sound file onto a real actual tape. Which, in theory, is fine. But getting the level right is probably a pain in the ass. I haven't tried it. Um, yeah, the volume matters and of course it's non-adjustable on, on these tape decks it's like they've just got a set level so if your tape volume's wrong bleh, won't work also there are those you can get like a a cassette with a lead in it it's for playing mp3 players on car stereos where all you've got in your car stereo is a cassette deck you could try them I tried one it was cheap crap and it didn't work um, and it probably killed the tape deck as well. I think that's why my Commodore 64 tape deck went to hell. I don't think it liked it at all. You could try that. I personally don't recommend it, though I do know some people who've tried it and apparently it works.
it's not something I'm going to try again. I've killed one death with it already with no success. Yeah, so that's that's how that works. Um, I've got another topic. I'm just trying to brain function thing. Hang on. Right. Second subject. The EEPROM 9 has just hit 100 subscribers, so congratulations to him. Um, I noted while leaving him a message congratulating him that it is now bloody hard to get new subscribers. I don't know if you've noticed this. Um, I mean, his reply was that he'd only noticed a slowdown in subscribers over Christmas because his video output was dropped because it was Christmas and so did mine but it's been like a couple of weeks and I've been putting up videos regularly and new subscribers are now really bloody hard to come by now I don't know uh, let's be clear I'm not for one moment complaining like oh I'm not getting enough subscribers no I've I've got a fantastic audience and if it never went up again I would be happy, um, you know, I'm, I'm gobsmacked at how many people watch. I'm interested in the technical aspect, the, the why. why. Why is it now so hard to get subscribers? What's changed? And I can't decide, is it the new layout? Is it that links to other channels? Depending on the design people use for their pages are now not so obvious. Are there just not enough clear links on pages? Is it that YouTube are not featuring other people's videos down the sidebar so much? I don't know. I, I'm unsure what the reason is. I mean, YouTube have been making it harder and harder over the past couple of years for non-partnered, non-big partnered channels to get noticed. It, when I started, um, all the way back in 2007, I think it was probably 2008 before I started putting up game related videos anyway, but when I started doing that it was still old style YouTube. Uh, Google had taken over by then but it was still pretty much old style. I was able to put up a video having no subscribers worth mentioning you know, two or three, I, uh, I don't know, not many, I could put up a video and guaranteed I would have a hundred views by the end of the night. And subscribers fairly came pouring in. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. If you haven't got a big subscriber base now, you could put up a video and get no views at all. That never used to be the case. So it is some, they've changed a whole number of things, the way the front page works, getting featured, it, it would be, you could be nobody, you know, not a big YouTube name, you could put up a video and for a little while you, your video would appear in the latest videos box, do they still have one of them? On the front page, um, you could get noticed, that now, no. You, you can't get noticed now without interacting, without people hitting like and favourite or, or shouting you out or something. You can't get noticed. And that, I believe that is a commercial decision on the part of YouTube. It's not about them wanting it to look nice the way they've done things. It's all about they want certain channels to get all the views because they're the ones that make the money. Fine, commercial decision, but it is killing what made YouTube in the first place, which is community, the, the little guy. They want it to be full of TV channels now and celebs. But anyway, that's not, this video is not about complaining, or it's not meant to be anyway. It's about, what can you do about it? YouTube is not going to make it easy to get noticed. What can you do about it? The person making the video really can't do a lot, except socialise, go around commenting. But, I mean, it's very easy to, to wind up in uh, comment spam. You do see it, where people will just comment 
<coughs> all over the place for the sake of commenting and maybe haven't even watched the video and they just leave a generic comment and you can spot them a mile off and, and you just think don't bother but you know mixing interacting is the way to get noticed but as the viewer you can help um, I know for the longest time it was uh, they had the five stars. Now they've just got the thumbs up or thumbs down. Personally, I find the thumbs down to be a fairly pointless thing. But uh, I know some people like it. I get at least two thumbs down on every video. Ah. Yeah. Um, but the thumbs up does make a difference. And I suppose favourites does. I mean, favourites has a, another function in that you've got your own favourites playlist so you can look back through them. But people do see if you favourited something. Um, either they, I don't look at other people's feed. Some people do, and and whether you like something or favourite it or whatever, it appears in your feed. But where it comes in really handy is things like Twitter. If you've got um, Twitter tied in with YouTube, and I, I, I guess it works with Facebook as well. Um, and it really does pay to have things like Facebook and Twitter and to use them and have them all tied in. But basically, hitting the thumbs up helps. And I'm, I'm not saying this for me. I've got a great audience that I'm really happy with. I'm not saying don't hit the thumbs up, but I'm not saying this because I want to get more views and more subs. I'm saying if you want to help someone, if you like their videos, anyone's videos, click the thumbs up. Do favourite if you think it's really good because it actually does help them. It's not pointless. The way YouTube has gone now, it's the only way some people are going to get noticed. Um, it's a shame. Yeah, but I, I do. I want to encourage you lot the people watching do use you might think thumbs up is pointless but it, I assure you it's not I know okay uh, I've got quite a few followers on Twitter well I say quite a few I've got about 450 something 458 which is not nearly as much as I've got YouTube subscribers but anyway it makes a difference because I know there have been occasions where I watched a video by someone with not many subscribers and I've gone along, watched it, clicked like, and all of a sudden they've had an influx of views because my Twitter followers have seen that, gone along, taken a look, and it's made a major difference. And that person who's made the video knows it and has sort of come back and said, well, thanks for doing that because my views just went, you know, significantly higher than they would have. So it, it makes a difference. It is worth doing. And I think in this day and age of corporate YouTube keeping down the little guy it <laughs> I don't know what am I trying to say it matters um, it's kind of like if you want to say yes yeah, screw you keeping us down that's the way to the way to stick it to them let the little guy flourish use the thumbs up hmm okay shout out time right then this week's shout out Niggs the boss Niggs spelt Z it's an interesting name I've never heard that before console gaming mods and repairs which sums up the channel really well he's got videos on well his latest video is um, taking apart and cleaning out and repairing the uh, snares and it's, it's actually got a really useful tip there. I've heard this before, but it's the first time I've heard it talked about in depth. The <sighs> opening up a snares is a bloody pain in the ass because they've got those stupid, well, they're not even screws, are they? They're, they're a weird thing. And he shows you how to deal with them if you haven't got the proper tool. And other useful stuff relating to uh, the snares, how not to basically fry it because the capacitors hold charge in it. And all that kind of stuff is very, is useful. Um, and he does it in an easy and informative manner. He's very... he flows, I think is the way I can describe it. He's got an easy flowing manner that y you're not sitting there trying to think, what's he talking about? You know what he's talking about. It's all clear and obvious and relaxed. And, I mean, I... I 
don't I don't do repairs and stuff like that but I still watch this because I like the way he did it it's easy easy to watch um, Neo Geo consoleized MBS let's let's just go straight to this page here because it's easy you can see exactly what it's got here mole car Chinese Mario Kart what yeah is that a, that's an iOS thing isn't it opening cleaning and checking why don't they do the stupid little thingy where it gives you the full title when you put your mouse over it that's annoying so yeah taking apart MVS's and having a poke around inside of them Neo Geo Pocket Color love them so yeah he's got Neo Geo related stuff here Metal Slug Neo Geo on the PS3 overview of the Saturn okay I've been sitting here thinking is he Australian or is he from New Zealand because I know if I get it wrong I'm going to upset him he's Australian no I'm not going to assume he's Australian he might still be in New Zealand and that just be from Australia either way he's down under he's got that cool funky accent and I can't pin down which one it is uh, sorry about that <laughs> but he's very he's easy to watch and that's that matters it matters to me anyway there are so many oh I don't want to there are so many great channels out there with great content where they're talking about something that's really interesting but they're not actually easy to watch um, you may or may not know what I mean I think it's all, it's all about delivery and how a person speaks um, he's easy to watch yeah gameplay videos um, I mean well, he's got 17 videos over four months so not putting them out I don't know are we, are we looking at one a week maybe yes I think we possibly are and they're good they're informative is the thing you know whether he's playing a game or doing an overview of a console or taking something apart and having a poke about inside you're gonna find something interesting there um, he's been commenting on my videos for a few weeks now I think very agreeable likeable chap highly recommended Nigs the boss console gaming mods and repairs highly recommended here we are back at closing comments where as usual I've got nothing remotely useful I can tell you and I only do it because it's a habit now <laughs> it's so you know you're at the end of the video what have I got coming up you know what I've got coming up lots more of the same I stockpiled a load of um, Atari 8-bit videos I did about 10 of them so uh, I've got plenty of them to do I did that so that I can sometimes I do one video a day and I actually record it I record one a day and it is time consuming I mean even doing them rough and ready like I do it takes a couple of hours out of my day where really I should be doing other stuff so uh, when I get the chance at a weekend I will uh, I just stockpile them I'll, I'll do a whole load of videos and save them up and upload them in a week and then I can spend my time doing other stuff <laughs> with more important things um, because there are more important things than YouTube shock horror and it, d doing those Atari games was really easy because they're all on a flashcard sent to me by my good friend Mark and Mark I haven't forgotten I do need to email you back because I, I know you sent me an email and I haven't replied yet I'm bloody appalling at replying to emails anyone else who sent me a message who I haven't replied to yet sorry <laughs> I'm oh. I know I've got one person I absolutely must reply to who uh, is in I think in Norway asking me about where where to buy games if there are some online game stores in the UK um, yeah I will get back to you so yes more Atari games I've got a little pile of videos of those lots of other stuff I want to do but it won't get done this week I do want to do a new like collection video showing showing my collection I'm, I'm debating when I get round to doing that am I going to do like I've done in the past where I walk around the room and point the camera at each one individually or am I going to take each one out of, off the shelf because they are sort of stacked in quite untidily and a bit cramped and you don't necessarily get a good view of them 
And I think actually what I'll probably end up doing is I'll do the walk around the room first so you can see how they are stored. And then when I, uh, I'll talk a bit more about each one individually and I will pull it out so you can get a better look at them. I think that's going to be the way to go. It's not going to happen this week. This week I really absolutely must get more work done on my website. I've got new hardware to put on it. I want to embed more videos. I need to write more articles. That's that's proven to be the hard part. And that's the most important bit that I should be doing. Actually writing about the stuff. Because when I write about a system I then make a video about it as well. Yeah. That's the plan. Whether or not it happens I don't know. Because I, I have lots of stuff going on. And most of it you don't even hear about. Because <laughs> it's none of your business. Yeah. Um I don't think so. Hmm. I don't think so. Probably. Alright. Gone blank now. Mind not working. Thank you for watching.